Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you very much. May we please call Mr. Harbinson? Mm hmm. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Could you confirm your full name, please, Mr. Harbinson? Gerald Owen Harbinson. You should have in a bundle in front of you a hard copy of a witness statement in your name dated the 17th of October of this year. Could you turn, please, to page 67 of that statement? Do you have a copy with a visible signature? I do. Is that your signature? It is. Um, I understand there is a correction you wish to make to paragraph 70 of this statement. Is that right? That's correct. Um, would you like to tell us what that is? Um, there are two names there, um, Brian Sharkey and Ray Platt. That should have read Ray Pratt, not Ray Platt. With that correction made, are the contents of the statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. For the purposes of the transcript, the reference for the statement is WITN 081501100. Thank you for coming to the inquiry to assist it in its work and for providing the witness statement that you have. As you know, I will be asking questions on behalf of the inquiry. You worked for the post office for 12 years, from 1998 to April 2010, when you moved to Royal Mail. Is that right? That's correct. And your first role was as a TV inquiry officer. Can you explain, please, what this role involved? Um, that was... Um uh, going out on site to visit properties um, that you were sent lists to, to, to visit to check on the um, um, uh, whether or not they were um, operating a TV with or without a licence. And in the year 2000, you were internally recruited into the post office security team as an investigation manager. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And you held this role until early 2005, when you became a compliance manager? That's correct. Before becoming a financial investigator later in the same year? That's correct. Did you remain a financial investigation, uh, did you remain in a financial investigation role until you left the post office in 2010? Yes, I did. You have provided some clarification in your statement at paragraph six to the effect that the word manager in the job title of investigation manager did not in fact mean that you held a managing position. Is that right? That's correct. So you were an investigator conducting investigations rather than a manager of those conducting investigations. That's, that's correct. You say in your statement at paragraph seven that there was a big intake into the security team at around the time you were internally recruited in the year 2000, with about 15 to 20 people being recruited at that point. That's correct. Were these people recruited internally as you were? I genuinely don't know the answer to that, but I, I believe they were. Do you know why there was a recruitment drive at this point in time? Uh, I, I wasn't aware of the reason. I know it covered both post office and Royal Mail. Did you have any experience in criminal investigations or criminal law when you became an investigator for the post office? No. You recall having training early on, which took place over the course of a few weeks. And you described this course at paragraph 61 of your statement. Could we have that on screen, please? 
It's page 24 of Mr. Harbinson's statement, WITM. Thank you. Page 24. A little further down at 61, please. And you say here, when I first joined the security team as an investigation manager, very early on, I was required to attend a formal training course at a college in Milton Keynes, which was led by two or three senior members of the security team. I recall that Mick Matthews was one of the trainers, and I remember he was very thorough in his teaching. Whilst I cannot remember all the modules we were required to learn, I believe that they did cover the following. The duties of investigators to conduct full and thorough investigations, taking witness statements in the course of an investigation, conducting interviews under caution, obtaining evidence in the course of an investigation, seeking evidence from third parties who might hold relevant evidence, and drafting investigation reports, and the legislation relevant to our role. In order to continue in the role of an investigation manager, you had to pass an exam at the end of the course. I cannot remember the specific details of that exam, but I do recall passing it. Is it right that this training was provided internally by post office security team members rather than being provided by external trainers? That is correct. Did your initial training cover disclosure as far as you can remember? I, I can't remember that initial training on that subject. You say at paragraph 10 of your statement that you also received training in the form of shadowing. How did that work? When you first joined a team, um, you, would, you would not be allowed to lead an investigation. You would always be a second or third body to the investigation. You'd be shadowing and listening and watching. Um, and, and uh, back in the office, you would be um, uh, taking instructions and listening to what the other investigators said about the roles that they were performing. Could you explain, please, the structure of your team when you first started as an investigator and how cases were allocated within the team? Do you refer to your statement if you need to. When you say the structure of the team, do you mean the investigation team or, or the team that I was in? The team that you were in. So you cover this at paragraph 11 of your statement. And you say here you had team leaders. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I was in a, um, uh, a team, I had a team leader. The team leader at that time, I think, was Tony Atting. There would be, the team consisted of about um, half a dozen investigators. The, that was the team that I was in. The investigation team as a whole would be team leaders around the country with the investigators. And then there was the, invest, uh, back to the investigation senior people you know, who, who run the, uh, the investigation side of things. And you say that you, uh, when you started in the role, you carried out investigations in, relate, in relation to potential pension allowance fraud to help identify whether such fraud was committed internally at the post office or externally. That is correct. And you say at paragraph 12, you also investigated cases where there was a discovery of a cash shortfall at a post office branch following an audit. That's correct. Where there was a discovery of an apparent cash shortfall at a post office branch, how did the investigation team become involved? The, that would come through from the casework management team 
uh, or from the audit team. Um, um, and they would be told the branch that, that had this shortfall. And then um, the team leader would all allocate the people that would go out to do the investigation. You address the process followed once an investigation commenced in an apparent shortfall case at paragraph 13 of your statement. If we could have that on screen, please. It's page five of Mr. Harbinson's statement. And you say this, when carrying out an investigation, I would collate the necessary records and documents, such as reports that the auditor had printed from the Horizon system on the day, take witness statements from relevant persons and conduct interviews under caution with the relevant persons, for example, the, the SPM. Taking this in stages, is it right that the Horizon data you were considering at this stage was that contained in the printout from the Horizon system obtained from the counter in the branch? That is correct. So you were simply looking at the record of what the Horizon system said should be held in a branch against the record of what the auditors actually found to be held in the branch? That would be part of the records that would come off. The the audit team could um, print off um, quite a few days or weeks of information from the system at that time. So there'd be quite a roll of information. I'm not sure exactly how far, they, I can't remember how far they could go back, but there would be, it would be quite an extensive roll of information that was printed off. But it was, uh, they were reports which were printed off from the counter in the branch. That's correct. Where an audit identified a discrepancy between the Horizon system reports and what was actually held at branch, how soon would you interview the sub postmaster or relevant member of staff? That would depend, I, 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 that, that could happen almost uh, immediately. It could, be, it could be days later, depending on the circumstances of the, of the, um, of the information and who, where the sub postmaster was or, or, um, or who else was in the, in, the, in the office. It could be over a period of time, but it's often fairly early in the investigation. You go on at paragraph 14 of your statement to say, following this, you would write up, <coughs> excuse me, you would write up a report of findings and open a case, open a case file. The report you refer to here, is that the report which would go to the criminal law team, the legal report produced by investigators? That that, that report would eventually arrive at with the criminal law team, yes. But the report of findings which you refer to here, that, that's referring to the legal report, is it? It is, yes. Did you ever conduct further inquiries or seek further evidence after conducting interviews, but before writing that report for the criminal law team? I, can't, I genuinely can't remember and, um, myself, but I'm, it's something you would do is, is if you didn't have all the information that you were going to submit in your report at that time, um, you might uh, do uh, further interviews with other people or subsequent interviews with the same person. Um, that would depend on a case by case, but I, uh, I, I can't recall. Is it right that you would send the case file once fully prepared to your team leader? <coughs> it, it would normally go th through the team leader, yes. Was it any part of your team leader's role on receipt of the file to review the evidence to determine whether further action should be taken in that case?
I, I, I can't remember the, uh, that part of it. I think they would give you ad, um, advice prior to writing your report as part of the team. Um, it's such a long time ago, I'm struggling to remember that. Um, I would, I would, I would only be guessing now, I can't remember. You say in your statement at paragraph 14 that your team leader would send the file to the casework management team to check it from a procedural standpoint. What do you mean by procedural standpoint here? I, th I think I'm talking about um, almost like the compliance to make sure all the documents were there that were, you know, if, um, if they were listed um, as items in the file, that they were actually in the file, things were, everything was complete, it was going to the right place. Um, it was like a, a, a check on it, really, I, I believe. I'd never worked in casework management, so I'm not completely sure. You also say in your statement at paragraph 14 that the report was then sent to the head of the security team. Is that right? I believe that's where it went, yes. You refer to Phil Gerrish, Tony Utting and John Scott having held the role of head of security at various points. Do you recall Tony Marsh at all? I, I know of Tony Marsh. I, I <laughs> I think he was always the, the, the senior person in both Royal Mail and Post Office at the same time. He was, he was very senior. I, I don't recall him being in charge of the investigation thing. Do you recall him holding the role of head of security prior to John Scott? I thought the head of security prior to John Scott was Phil Gerrish and Tony Marsh was senior to Phil Gerrish. So there was post office, sorry, and Royal Mail. To, um, Phil Gerrish head of uh, post office and I thought Tony Marsh was head of both groups, Royal Mail and post office, but my, my memory is in that area, sorry. Do you recall that there was a role entitled National Internal Crime and Investigations Manager when you were an investigator? I don't remember that title, I'm sorry. Do you think that might have been the role which Mr Gerrish and Mr Utting held rather than the overarching head of security role? I'd be guessing now, I can't remember. Could we have paragraph 15 of Mr. Harbinson's statement on screen, please? It's page five. Towards the bottom, that's it. You say here, once the case file was with the head of the security team, it is my understanding that they would then liaise with the case management to get it passed on to the criminal law team in the, in the POL. I do not know if there were any specific factors considered to determine whether to pass it on or not, or whether all, all case files were passed on in any event, other than on an evidential basis, which I deal with in paragraphs 18 and 19 below. I do not believe that I had any involvement with liaising directly with any other poll department during my role as an investigation manager. I believe that any other necessary cross-department liaison was dealt with by colleagues in, more, in a more senior position to me or with casework management. As far as you can recall, did the head of security review the evidence in a case before the case was transferred to the criminal law team to determine whether further action should be taken in the case? I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the head of the security did with the documents or, or uh, what evaluation he made of them. In terms of the decision on whether someone should be prosecuted, 
you say at paragraph 16 of your statement that you believe it was always the decision of the criminal law team whether to pursue a criminal prosecution or not, and you do not recall that decision ever being made by anyone in the security team. Do you recall the title of designated <coughs> prosecution authority from the time you were an investigator? I, I, I don't recall that, that position. No, I, I don't, don't remember it clearly. Could we turn, please, uh, scroll down, please, to paragraph 18 of your statement? You say here, in the event that an incident I had investigated was being prosecuted, I would continue to assist the criminal law team on an ev evidential basis. For example, if the criminal law team required additional evidence, the criminal law team or my team leader would inform me and I'd carry out additional work to obtain such evidence, for example, taking an additional witness statement. Due to the passage of time, I am unable to recall any specific examples of this occurring. After a decision had been made to prosecute, would it be fair to say that any further inquiries or evidence gathering would be reactive and done when required by the criminal law team? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. So after a decision has been made to prosecute, yes. so you've done your legal report, it's gone to the criminal law team and a decision has been made to prosecute the individual. With reference to this paragraph that we've just looked at, were your further inquiries or evidence gathering done when required by the criminal law team rather than because you decided you should do further inquiries or evidence gathering? It would be on instruction if I, if I had been required to do something. I w that would come, I believe, from the criminal law team. Were you ever involved in investigating a case which went to trial in the Crown Court or in any other case in which external solicitors or counsel were instructed to prosecute? Do you mean at, at the actual court, attending the court? A any case where your investigation led to um, criminal proceedings in which external solicitors and counsel were involved. I think the solicitors always came from, from the, our criminal law team. Um, the, in the court itself, the, the, the barristers and, uh, and, uh, were from other um, um, chambers, I think it's called, um, but um, it, everything came from our own criminal law team, I believe. So you don't recall receiving requests, even if those came via the criminal law team, to conduct further investigations, requests coming from prosecuting counsel or an external prosecuting agent? I can't recall, no. Were you ever asked to obtain further information as a result of a disclosure request or an assertion contained within a defendant's defence case statement? I, I can't recall. You say at paragraph 19 of your statement that you had to assist the criminal law team with meeting any disclosure obligations which you say involved compiling a list of all used and unused evidence in the investigation and collating those documents into a bundle. Would that bundle then be provided to the criminal law team? It would, yes. Did you understand when you were an investigator assisting the criminal law team with disclosure that you were acting as the disclosure officer in the case? Yes. At the time, did you understand that this was a distinct role over and above your role as an investigator, which imposed on you additional and distinct duties? I, 
and, and it was invariably the role of the investigator that did the pro produce the disclosure list and, and and as part of the of the committal bundle but um, the, the I, I knew about disclosure that everything you obtained had to be disclosed and as used or unused but the, um, I, I was aware that, that we had to produce those lists and those documents and, and supply them to the criminal law team. Who would you have gone to if you were in any doubt about whether there was an obligation to disclose material? Back then, I, I think the first port of call would have been to my team leader, but certainly... Um, Certainly, I would have seen it progressed from there, but, but initially, certainly the team leader. Do you recall being aware that when you were acting as a disclosure officer, you had obligations under the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act? I believe I did. Do you recall being aware when you were acting as a disclosure officer that you had obligations under the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act Code of Practice? Such a long time ago. I believe that that, that, that was a role, yes. And the same question in relation to the Attorney General's guidelines on disclosure. I, I don't remember that particular st um, 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 line that you've spoken there. Um, it, um, it's not something that comes back to me to mind. Were key pieces of legislation which governed the conduct of investigations and disclosure provided to investigators, as far as you can recall? I genuinely can't remember. Can you recall ever accessing such legislation when you were an investigator? It would be easy for me to say yes, but I can't remember. What about key policy documents governing the conduct of investigations and disclosure? Were these provided to investigators, as far as you can recall? I, I, I don't recall. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 306425? This is a disclosure officer's report. Is this one of the forms you recall completing when you were an investigator? You can scroll down a little, please, so that we can see the full page. Don't worry about the specific details no, no. of this form at the moment. It, it looks familiar, yes. And scrolling back up, please. We can see beneath the case name, the following items are listed on the schedule, schedules for this case and may undermine the prosecution case, primary disclosure, assist the defence, secondary disclosure, or are required to be supplied under section 7.3 of the code. Delete is applicable. So this form requires the disclosure officer to identify any unused material which may undermine the prosecution case or assist the defence. Is that right? Yes. Was that the question which you applied to the unused evidence gathered during the investigation when you completed disclosure forms to assist the criminal law team? Oh. 
or do you not remember applying your mind to that? I, I don't remember that, no. No. Who made the final decision on whether material should be disclosed in any given case? That would be the criminal law team. Would you agree that it was important for the criminal law team to be aware of the existence of all material which might undermine the prosecution case or assist the defence? Yes. Did you understand the importance, therefore, of the job you were doing when completing the disclosure schedules? Yes, I believe we did. Were you aware when you were an investigator that there was an obligation on a criminal investigator to pursue lines of inquiry which pointed away from the guilt of the suspect? Yes. In an apparent shortfall case, did you understand it to be any part of your role to make inquiries into the reliability of the core evidence being relied upon to evidence, for example, theft? <coughs> Sorry, I didn't understand that. When you were an investigator yep. and you were investigating an apparent shortfall case, did you understand it to be any part of your role to inquire into the reliability of the evidence you were relying upon to demonstrate, for example, theft. So specifically speaking, oh, Horizon reports. Hmm. Not sure that it's a piece of information that I could have obtained but I'm aware that on where Horizon data was used in evidence, I, I believe there was there was witness statement from Fujitsu to say that the date the system was working correctly at the time of the, the 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 material time, but I'm not sure how as an investigator I would have checked the reliability of the, the system. But I understood that was part of, um, it became part of the investigation, yes. We'll come on to evidence from Fujitsu shortly. But staying with what you understand, understood your role to be in terms of inquiries when you were conducting your investigation, in an apparent shortfall case, where an essential element of an offence to which an investigation related was dishonesty, did you, as a matter of course, make financial inquiries relating to the suspect as part of your investigation? Would I or did I? Did you? I can't remember back cases back then, but part of it now I can't remember cases back that far um, you would have looked at the financial position of people yes in an apparent shortfall case where a suspect was saying that they did not understand where an apparent shortfall had come from did you make inquiries relating in particular to the operation, reliability and accuracy of Horizon data? I can't remember doing that, no. Was there a checklist of steps to take or any other guidance to ensure all relevant information was identified collected and sent to the criminal law team in proceedings brought by the post office against sub-postmasters? 
I don't recall a, a checklist. When you first became an investigator, were you aware of the rollout of the Horizon system? Sorry? When you first became an investigator, and that was in 2000, and in the early point of being an investigator, were you aware of the rollout of the Horizon system, its introduction? I knew it was a new system that had come in, yes. Did you have any awareness of there being bugs, errors and defects or any acceptance incidents during the rollout of the Horizon system? Not that I recall, no. Were you given any training on the Horizon system at any stage? I seem to recall some training on, on how to obtain data off of the system, how to, how to produce the data. Um, but genuinely, um, that was usually done by the, uh, the audit team. By obtaining data, do you mean printing off the yes. reports from yes. the counter in the branch? Yes. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 64 of Mr. Harbinson's statement? That's page 25 of WITN. Page 25. And at paragraph 64, you say this, in relation to training about obtaining information from third parties, particularly for Jitsu, I do recall receiving training on the processes to follow. However, I cannot recall when and how this training was delivered. I deal further with such processes under the subheading analysing horizon data and requesting ARQ data from Fujitsu below. Can you recall how long this training lasted, the training on obtaining information from third parties? From the Fujitsu training? But you've referred here to receiving training about yes. obtaining information from third parties, particularly Fujitsu and being trained on the processes. You say you can't recall when and how the training was delivered, but can you recall how long the training lasted? No. Can you remember who delivered it? I don't remember clearly. It might have been by the audit of some of the auditors. I don't recall, but I think it might, it might have been by the audit team. So when you refer to obtaining information from third parties, are you referring here again to the printing out of data from the counters in branches or something different? I think, I think that's what I refer to, yes. Did anyone tell you that there was a duty on you as an investigator to obtain and consider third party material from, for example, financial institutions and Fujitsu in appropriate cases? I, I, believe, I, I believe that would have been a part of it, the training, yes, and understanding that the Fujit, you could obtain further Fujitsu data, there was the, uh, the ability to do that. You deal with the process by which Horizon data was obtained at paragraph 75 of your statement. Yeah. Could we turn to that please? It's page 31. Do you say here at paragraph 75, I can comment on how Horizon data was obtained and, and, and analysed in more general terms where a cash shortage was discovered during an audit. 
the relevant horizon printouts were obtained by the auditor on the day at the branch. If anything further was required during, during an investigation, for example, printouts from an earlier period to determine at which point the accounts no longer balanced, then you could receive this information directly from Fujitsu. An investigation manager could simply ask the case management team to make this request to Fujitsu. In general terms, did you consider that the horizon printouts obtained by an auditor, the counter-printed reports, were sufficient evidence of a loss? Sorry, the last bit. Were sufficient evidence of a loss? So the printouts that yeah. were obtained by the auditor, in general terms, did you consider those to be sufficient evidence of a loss alone? Yeah. Uh, yes, they were I, I would consider them evidence of the loss, but depending on, if it was me in investigating, depending on what the um, came up on interviews, you might need to go back further to established and to look at further documents uh, and, and go to the casework and obtain further data. What guidance was given to investigators to assist them in obtaining Horizon data from Fujitsu? I don't know what guidance was given. Well, do you recall there being any, apart from being aware you could request data? Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew you could re, re, that further data could be requested. I'm not sure you need what guidance there was on that. What further data or audit reports did you understand could be produced by Fujitsu over and above the printouts? genuinely don't remember. Were you ever made aware that an enhanced interrogation of the audit trail could show when a transaction or event had been performed by the system? I'm not aware of that. Who was responsible for deciding whether to retrieve Horizon data from Fujitsu? I think initially would be the investigator, but further um, that might come from uh, the criminal law team might advise you to get further data. Um, I don't, on a case by case, I don't, I don't know. Were there ever circumstances in which you would request more detailed audit data from Fujitsu before you interviewed a sub-postmaster or a member of their staff? I don't, I don't recall that happening. Was that step ever taken before a decision was made to prosecute? I don't recall. Were you aware that there was a quota placed on audit request queries made of Fujitsu? No. At paragraph 75 that we've just looked at, you describe processes for obtaining horizon data in the context of cases where a cash shortage was discovered during an audit but you say at paragraph 74 of your statement that you do not recall ever recall a situation where a cash shortfall that you were investigating was attributed to problems with Horizon by anyone subject to the investigation. By that, do you mean that you cannot recall anyone saying the shortfall is caused by problems with the system? I don't recall that, no. When you were an investigator, 
were you aware of any other investigators having investigations where a shortfall was attributed to problems with Horizon? I don't recall. Did you ever have an apparent shortfall case where someone was saying they simply couldn't explain how an apparent shortfall had occurred? No. Not that I... I, I don't recall that, no. Were you ever aware that there were bugs, errors or defects in the Horizon system which had the potential to cause discrepancies in branch accounts? Certainly not. Would you agree that it was critical for investigation managers and those overseeing investigations to be informed of any ongoing technical issues with the Horizon system? Yes. You refer at paragraph 76 of your statement to believing it to have been common to have a Fujitsu manager as an expert witness in criminal proceedings relating to cash shortages, to provide their own analyses on the data and to determine whether Horizon was operating properly. What, what is the basis for that belief? I believe that um, they were a witness at, at any trial, if not in, in attendance, but certainly part of the committal bundle would contain a witness statement. Um, that, that's what I always thought and always believed occurred um, because it was a, a, a question of the reliable, reliability of the, the evidence that you were producing. Do you recall when a Fujitsu manager was engaged in this way, before or after a charging decision? I don't know. Do you recall the name of any Fujitsu manager engaged in that way? No. Were you ever involved in providing instructions to any Fujitsu manager engaged in this way? No. When you use the term expert, are you referring to the status of an expert witness in legal proceedings, or do you mean that they had expertise in the system? I thought it was because they were an expert they were they were producing a, a witness statement or in person uh, as a as a uh, an expert on the system and the reliability of the system at that at that particular time would such a statement usually simply produce audit data or Horizon helpline call logs, or would they include specific analysis of the data or call logs in that specific case, as far as you can recall? I don't recall the specifics of their statement. Turning please to the compliance manager role you held in 2005, you say in your statement that you were internally promoted to this role in early 2005, is that right? That's correct. Who did you report to in this role? Uh, David Pardo. And what did your role entail? Well, to start with, I, I was uncertain about what it was that I was doing, but it, it, it was really panned out as... Um, the um, compliance of, and con of the case file, the construction and, uh, and, um, and um, times of case files um, to try and raise the standard of the, 
of the, the, uh, the file itself. Can you recall now the type of forms you would have expected to see an investigator completing? Sorry? Can you recall now the type of forms you would have expected to see an investig investigator completing in 2005? Um, some of them, yes, but um, for me, it was about the uh, uh, the, compli the the file itself, the green file, with the how everything was meant to be laid out in it, uh, with the different documents, um, the different different appendices, that type of thing. As a compliance manager. Did the issue of the accuracy of Horizon ever arise? No. In the short time that you held this role, did you come across the identification codes document that you address at paragraph 73 of your statement? I, I, I knew there was identification codes, but I don't recall that, doc that document. You say in paragraph 73 of your statement that you do recall investigation managers being instructed to assign identification codes to suspected offenders. Does it remain the case that you cannot recall the reasoning behind that? That's true, yes. You say at paragraph 73, and if we can just go back a page, please. That you cannot remember seeing this document. Is that at any point that you were employed by the post office? I don't remember seeing that document. And is that why you say you cannot recall what your view at the time was of the appropriateness of the codes described? I, 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 don't, I, I didn't see that document, I don't believe. I, I don't recall that, no. Or its appropriateness. Moving, please, to your role as a financial investigator. You say at paragraph 22 of your statement that you and Mick Matthews were both put forward for a new role for the security team, that of financial investigator by David Bardot. Is that right? Correct. And this would have been late 2005, you think? That's correct. You say this new role was campaigned for by David Pardot. Is it right that the purpose of creating the role was to recoup losses through the proceeds of Crime Act 2002? Yes. You and Mr Matthews were both successful in obtaining the role. Was it initially just the two of you who held that role? I think Graham Ward was with us for a very short, uh, for a few weeks uh, uh, or month, but where he went back to being casework manager and it remained as myself and Mick Matthews. And you had a national remit covering all areas of the UK? Um, not Scotland. You discuss the training you received for the role at paragraph 24 of your statement. Could we have that on screen, please? It is page eight of the statement. And at paragraph 24, you say this. 
All training for my financial investigator role was provided under the Asset Recovery Agency, ARA, who at that time were the government department established under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, POCA, to take action against those benefiting from crime. As far as I'm aware, the Financial Investigation Unit within Pol were one of the first non-police bodies who applied to exercise powers of recovery under POCA. The ARA took the lead in delivering the relevant training to myself and Mick Matthews in order for us to become accredited financial investigators. In doing so, they provided us with a mentor, Elaine Blewett, who was an experienced accredited financial investigator in the police. Initially, we received mentoring from Elaine Blewett and carried out our work under her supervision and accreditation. This continued until we passed the necessary exams in place to become accredited ourselves. I cannot recall what the specific exams were, but I remember them being very difficult and requiring a lot of preparation and application of the knowledge we had gained from our mentoring and experience so far. I was qualified in POCA parts two, four, and eight. You say at the next paragraph, at paragraph 25, that once you passed your exams and became accredited, you were able to carry out your duties as an accredited financial investigator independently. Do you mean by that that you no longer carried out your work under the supervision of Elaine Blewett, the police accredited financial investigator? That's correct. But you did report to David Pardo who was your senior authorising officer. We did, yes. And Mr Pardo would review and approve any work you had done, where necessary, in line with ARA guidance. Correct. <coughs> you deal with what your role as a financial investigator entailed at paragraph 26 of your statement, about halfway down the page. And you say this. My role as a financial investigator essentially involved the recovery of financial loss suffered by the POL following a conviction for crimes such as theft of POL assets and false accounting. This involved investigating what assets were held by the convicted individual and how they could potentially cover the loss suffered and the likelihood of recovery. In some cases, it also involved making a case for restraint over particular assets found in order to stop them from being dissipated prior to any application for a confiscation order being awarded following a conviction. Any restraint considered would not be done without the approval of my senior authorising officer, David Pardo, and ultimately the approval of the criminal law team. You go on at paragraph 27. I would also put together an application to the court for a confiscation order in doing so, I would produce a Section 16 statement completed on a pro forma available from the ARA. Such a statement would attach and address all the evidence obtained during my financial investigation against the convicted individual and attempt to logically set out my reasoning, aims and objectives around obtaining a confiscation order for the judge to consider. It would be passed on to the criminal law team to review and approve. If approved, they would then arrange for it to be served on the defendant's solicitor and filed at court. You say at paragraph eight that where the court proceeded to grant a confiscation order, it would always be requested that a compensation order be attached for the same amount. And you address this in a little more detail at paragraph 115 of your statement. Can you explain please why this was done, the request for a compensation order? Yes. <clears throat> the, any funds obtained from a confiscation order were then set, would then go centrally to the Asset Recovery Agency, and that money would be distributed between all those bodies carrying out financial investigations and was used to, to drive forward further uh, uh, um, confiscation initiatives throughout the UK. So that money uh, would not come back to Post Office Limited as the, the, the loser, in this case, the public money. So therefore, you were required to attach a 
comp a compensation order, which then would um, take the confiscated amount and pay that exact the same money in compensation back to Post Office Limited. So it didn't disappear into the asset recovery agency coffers uh, for distribution. It came back to uh, Post Office Limited. There was no double jeopardy, it was the same money. You say in your statement that the financial investigation unit had no role in enforcing a confiscation order once obtained. Can you just explain why that was? <coughs> once we'd gone through the court process of confiscation and the order was made, it then went to the regional asset recovery teams, whether that's by the asset recovery agency or by the courts themselves. They would follow through and they were the people um, programmed to make recoveries once the order was made. It didn't come back to uh, our team. We were kept informed about w when money was received and when it was going to come back and it, was, it came back to the criminal law team. Um, but we were kept informed about the process, not the process, but the actual amounts that were, were recovered. But the, the, the process of recovery was outside of Post Office Limited. You also say at paragraph 30 of your statement that the financial investigator did not play any part in investigating the pot potential criminal incident. In relation to a number of the specific cases you address in your statement, you were copied into correspondence about the progress of a criminal prosecution. Can you assist with why that was? I think once the, uh, it was coming to um, um, the financial investigators for confiscation, people just naturally started to copy us in and keep us informed about the process and where we were. It was quite important for us to know um, the court process because we needed documents ready so that we could produce them uh, at the um, uh, sentencing hearing. For example, a, um, uh, a section, I think it was a section 18, which is a provision of information, which would have to be served on the day. So we would need to know when, uh, or what stage cases were in the prosecution process. But they, they kept us informed of all those types of, once the cases were going to be picked up by, by the, the confiscation team. You say at paragraph 30 that the financial investigator might start the recovery process earlier than post-conviction in cases where a sub-postmaster had admitted to actions of theft or false accounting from the outset. Is that right? That's correct. And you say in your statement at paragraph 31 that when Mr. Matthews left the post office in late 2006 or early 2007, you were left with the entire financial investigation caseload. Do we take it from that, that apart from the short time you remember Graham Ward being involved, until that point, the financial investigation team consisted of you and Mr. Matthews reporting to David Pardot? That's correct. But after Mr. Matthews left, two others were brought in to help manage the workload. That's correct. And those other two were Paul Southern and Graham Ward? That's correct. <coughs> At that point, is it right that you became financial investigation, un investigation unit manager and you trained Mr. Southern and Mr. Ward to manage their own recovery cases. I did. I took them through the same process that we went through with the Asset Recovery Agency um, uh, taking the lead role in the examinations and training as well. So they had the same experience that you did? Yes, but I was their mentor. 
I see. Was it at this point when the Financial Investigation Unit formally came into being when Mr Matthews left and you were given two other people? Sorry. So prior to this point, had the Financial Investigation Unit existed formally as a unit or had it just been you and Mr Matthews doing the work? Before, it was, it, we, we were a team together, Mick Matthews and I, and the team became three people when um, it was myself, uh, Graham Ward and Paul Southern. But that, they, that was the Financial Investigation Unit, yes. And had you always been known as the Financial Investigation Unit from the point you and Mr Matthews took up your roles? I, I see we can I, I'm not sure where, when the, the word unit was added on, but I think probably you're right that it, when, when there was three of us. You went on to become the senior authorising officer for Mr. Southern and Mr. Ward. That's correct. And you say at paragraph 42 of your statement that the financial investigation unit sat within the investigatory arm of the security team. That's correct. But its role was distinct from the role of investigation managers. That's correct. Sir, I have reached the end of uh, one topic. I wonder if we may, might take our morning break at that point, slightly yeah, earlier than usual. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what are we going to do? Begin again at 11.25? Yes, sir. Thank you. Fine. Thank you. Hello, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Mr. Harbinson, you deal at paragraph 45 of your statement with policy and guidance applying to the work of financial investigators. Um, could we have paragraph 45 on screen, please? That's page 18 of Mr. Harbinson's statement. You say, I have been asked to set out the legislation policies and or guidance that governed the conduct of criminal and financial investigations during the period I worked within the security team. When I worked as an investigation manager within the security team, I do not remember any particular internal policies or guidance that governed the work I carried out. I believe that policies were created and introduced over time, but I am unable to pinpoint when or what they related to. I can only rely on the policies provided to me with the request, and as explained above, most of those policies post-date my time at the poll. However, as I was investigating incidents that may have a potential criminal element, which involved carrying out interviews under caution and taking witness statements during an investigation, I was, of course, required to understand and adhere to the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984 and the PACE Codes of Practice. There were other acts which I, that I had to refer to, and whilst I would not be able to reference these from direct memory, I believe it would have been all the legislation listed in uh, section 3.15 of the document. At paragraph 46, you talk about the financial investigation unit, and you say again, when I joined the financial investigation unit, I believe there were no internal policies or guidance to govern our area of practice in place. We were a new subsection within the security team. Therefore, internal policies and guidance documents were yet to be created. We relied on the policies and guidance put in place by the ARA, which our police mentor, Elaine Blewett, would have made us aware of. Unfortunately, I cannot recall what those specific policy or guidance documents were, especially as they evolved continuously in line with the developments to POCA and changes within the ARA itself. When you stopped being supervised by your police mentor, how would you have been made aware of any changes in policy or guidance? Um, 
the, the asset uh, recovery agency continued um, uh, and maintained contact with us as they did with all other financial investigators and there was continual updates sent to us later on i recall that they they gave us weekly or monthly tests um, they sent us um, changes in uh, proceeds of crime act um, they kept us informed with changes and updates so we were constantly we were always in contact with the asset recovery agency and their trainers you say you would have relied heavily on the proceeds of crime act itself to ensure you were carrying out your practice appropriately absolutely and this was the central piece of legislation that governed your activities as a financial investigator yes You note in your statement that the policy documents which do specifically relate to financial investigation policy post-date your time as an employee of the post office. There is, however, an undated document which you were provided with for the purposes of preparing your statement, which you describe as an early attempt at a process map relating to the work undertaken by the financial investigation team in line with the guidance put in place by the ARA. Could we have that on screen, please? The reference is POL 0008489. The title is Security and Investigation Debt process text. The document is, as you observe, undated. It has two sections, one starting on the first page, dealing with security and scrolling up, I'm sorry, dealing with security and investigation, financial investigation unit, criminal debt recovery process for amounts under £25,000. Then on page 11 of this document, please. There is a section dealing with security and investigation, criminal debt recovery process for more than 20,000 pounds. Going back to the first page, please. <coughs> Towards the end of the first paragraph here, um, there is a reference to you being the financial investigation unit manager. Yeah. Based on the reference to the joint asset recovery database, which you think the post office only started using from 2009, is it right that you think this document is likely to have been created at some point in that year, in 2009? I, I, I believe so. I'm not sure when this document was created. Um, well, if it assists to look at your statement. <laughs> it's paragraph 41 of yep. your statement. And you say the reference to you as a financial investigations unit manager indicates the document must have been created at some point from 2007 onwards. And jarred, yeah. I, get, I understand now, yes. And you say it's, more like, it's most likely to have been created sometime in 2009 as it refers to the Joint Asset Recovery Database. Yes. JARD was a system maintained by the ARA to log the actions taken in a financial investigation and was implemented later on in my career, but you believe that the post office only starting using that from 2009 onwards. Correct. So that's the basis on which you say you think this document was likely created in 2009. As far as you're aware, is this the first policy or guidance document 
that dealt with um, the role of the Financial Investigations Unit? I, it's the first one I've seen, and I don't recall this one. You say you don't recall it. Um, have you had a chance to read through the processes set out in it for the purposes of preparing your statement? I've read it through, yes. And as far as you can recall, do the processes set out in this document reflect the processes which were followed during the time you were the Financial Investigation Unit Manager? I think so, yes. You say at paragraph 59 of your statement that all, although financial investigators would provide an opinion on the best mode of recovery, you never made the ultimate decision on whether criminal enforcement proceedings should be pursued. Who did make the ultimate decision? That, um, it would be the criminal law team and um, the um, senior people within the investigation team. It usually came back to us from Dave Pardo, um, who's, who was the, the senior per person managing uh, uh, myself and, and the, the team. But it, it came from, I believe, the, the criminal law team or, or seniors in, in the investigation team. As far as you can recall, was any application for a confiscation order prepared by you not approved by the criminal law team? It was always uh, had to be approved. Uh, a confiscation order had to be approved by the criminal law team. But where that was being proposed, because you drafted up paperwork proposing a confiscation order. Did the criminal law team ever disagree with the proposal that a confiscation order should be sought? I wouldn't draw up a section 16 if it hadn't already been agreed that that's where we were going. In terms of the possible modes of recovery, as you term them, can you explain please the difference between a restraint order and a confiscation order? Yes. A restraint order restrains an asset and prevents a person from disposing or, uh, or reducing that asset until um, it's resolved in the courts, whereas a confiscation order is the order um, made by the courts to remove the benefit of the criminal conduct in, in, in an order. What were the considerations in play when it came to restraint orders? It had to be proportionate. Um, there had to be a realistic um, asset to, to restrain, uh, a benefit within it. Um, but but it, had to, it had to be proportionate. You, you wouldn't you wouldn't restrain um, a, a property for a few thousand pounds or, or a bank account for a few th thousand pounds. It had to be a proportionate uh, uh, effect, and there had to be re consideration made to the to the defendant's living um, a bit, their ability to to live normally uh, within that restraint. So you you, you wouldn't block them from, from living. You were, you were trying to secure assets that could be, could be used to service a confiscation order in the future. Where a decision was made to pursue a restraint order, what was your role in relation to the process? As the financial investigator, I, I would have to... Um, come to a rationale about why I wanted to restrain, what was, what was the objective in, uh, in restraining the assets, I would have to get the agreement of the senior authorising officer. 
and I would then have to take it to the criminal law team for them to agree for an asset to be restrained. I would then have to write up the restraining order myself and I'd have to present it in court uh, for a judge um, to um, authorise the restraint. Then I would have to um, return that back to the criminal... Uh, but that would have to be then served on the the defendant. Um, basically, I think I've run through about all I meant to, as I recall. That's that's that would be my job. Um, but it would be it would have to be authorised. It would have to be signed by a judge. All those things would have to to be in place. What were the considerations in play when it came to confiscation orders? The confiscation order needed to list all the assets available um, for the confiscation. We'd have to list what the confiscation, what the amount was that the confiscation was, was for. Um, that would uh, the inve the financial investigator would have to. Um, there was quite a process before you arrived at it, but you would have to write the section 16 statement, and and uh, having obtained all the documents, well, um, and that would all have to be served on the defendant. They would have an opportunity to reply to that, and the the court may may have made an an option for you for a further response from the from the for the section 16 but that it would then go to court and um, uh, the order would be made one way or the other you deal at paragraph 58 of your statement with the case for confiscation where a conviction was for false accounting yes. could we have that on screen please it's page 23 of the statement and at paragraph 58 you say although not impossible it was a lot harder to justify a case for confiscation where a person had been convicted for false accounting this is because confiscation essentially relates to removing the convicted person's benefit that they received as a result of criminal conduct in order to recover the losses faced by the poll. It would be extremely difficult to work out what the benefit received actually was in a false accounting case. When you say it was a, a lot harder to justify a case for confiscation where a conviction was for false accounting, do you mean in comparison to a conviction for theft? Yes. Can you explain why it is easier to achieve a confiscation order following a theft conviction, please? You deal with this a little further at paragraph 109 yeah, because, in your statement. I understand. Because on, on a theft, you have a figure of benefit by the, uh, 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 of the criminal conduct. Um, and so it's quite uh, quite easy to set out your, your objective in the confiscation order to say... I want to recover the, that figure because that's the figure that was uh, involved in the theft. Whereas in false accounting, you've got to come up and arrive at a figure, how the person benefited by that figure in uh, a false accounting. So that one is easier than, they're not, they're not, they're not impossible, but they're, one's easier than the other. Could we have on screen please document reference POL 001-21639. This is a presentation handout which you comment on at paragraph 66 of your statement. You describe it as being an attempt to raise the understanding and profile of recovery through POCA 
and the role of the financial investigation unit within the post office. And the title here is Financial Investigations Partnership for Recovery, your name and Graham Ward's on that front slide. Was this presentation delivered to the post office criminal investigators? I, I don't remember this. I, I, I can see that uh, we produced it, but I don't remember it. I, its purpose would have been um, to, to go out to the investigation teams. Do you recall being involved in producing the content of this? I don't recall being involved in the, producing the contents of it, no. Do you think that you were, given that your name appears it's on the Most front? likely, yes. Could we turn to page 14 of this document, please? The heading on this slide is how can I make the offender pay when the courts don't ever award compensation or costs? Brackets, get the offences charged right. And the slide goes on as follows. The first bullet point, theft, fraud and money laundering offences support the POCA 2002 and Criminal Justice Act 1988 confiscation process and in consequence recovery of the loss. Bullet point two, settling for false accounting as the predicate <coughs> offence creates massive problems with recovery. Brackets, what is the offender's benefit? Bullet point three, the investigation and the interview should be programmed to establish what has happened to you, what is and where is the criminal property, what offences have occurred, and to what extent others are involved in those offences and or have benefited. Is this you sharing your view expressed at paragraph 58 of your statement with the criminal investigation team, namely that it was harder to get a confiscation order for false accounting than it was for theft and other offences? I think that's it within it. I don't think that's the extent of, it, of my view there. Could we have on screen, please, page three of this presentation? <laughs> this covers the fraud team's recovery objective for 2007 to 2008. And the first bullet point says, deliver casework effectively to ensure 30% loss recovery or greater is achieved 2007 to 2008. It would not be unreasonable to project future fraud strand recovery targets to increase year on year. The next bullet point, deliver casework effectively to ensure 35% loss recovery or greater is achieved 2008 to 2009. Three, deliver casework effectively to ensure 40% loss recovery or greater is achieved 2009 to 10, et cetera, et cetera. Is it fair to say that recovery was a key goal for the fraud team? It was a goal for the financial investigation team. I would have hoped that it was a, um, that more investigators would look at the recovery side of things. Could we have on screen, please, POL 0005139? Looking, please, at the email about halfway down the page from Phil Taylor a legal executive in the criminal law team, to Warwick Tapford, counsel in the case to which this email relates, the case, the case of Seema Misra. This is dated the 22nd of May, 2009. And the email reads as follows. Hi, Warwick. I am just a little bit in the dark about Misra. You will recall that there is one count of theft and some false accountings. 
the defence will plead guilty to the false accountings, and John Longman is fairly happy for us to accept those pleas. <coughs> However, we are some 70-odd thousand pounds light at the moment, as I understand it, and if we just accept the false accountings, it is very difficult for us later to obtain a confiscation order and subsequently compensation out of the confiscation. Could you let me have your views on this? I'd be very grateful to hear from you. Did you share your view on getting the charges right and the difficulty of achieving a confiscation order off the back of a false accounting conviction or plea with the criminal law team? Do you remember having any discussions with them about that? I, I think later we see a document where I, I exactly say that to the criminal law team. Um, I'm not surprised by that, no. You provided some advice on confiscation in relation to the prosecution of Josephine Hamilton, and you deal with that at paragraphs 106 to 110 of your statement. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 00049154? <coughs> This is a memo from Juliet McFarlane. So scrolling down, please, to the bottom. Principal Lawyer, Criminal Law Division. To the investigation team, scrolling up to the top, please. Copied to you, among, two, among others, including Graham Brander and Dave Pardo. It is dated the 15th of November, 2007. And we see there it relates to the case of Josephine Hamilton. And it reads as follows. I refer to previous correspondence regarding this matter. As you know, there has been some discussion as to whether or not pleas to false accounting would be acceptable. I note this would be agreeable, providing that Mrs. Hamilton were to repay the full amount. On council's request, this matter has been listed for mention on the 19th of November, 2007. The purpose of this is to see whether or not the trial can be vacated. It is possible that Mrs. Hamilton may wish to enter pleas to false accounting. I understand, however, that she is not yet in a position to repay and has not given a date as to when this can be done. One option would be for the theft count to be left on file pending payment by the date of trial or some later date. And then in bold, Jed, could you let me have your views as to confiscation in this matter and, if appropriate, the prospect of recovery under such an order? A copy of the indictment is attached. Do you recall uh, giving advice in this case now? Or are you reliant upon the documents? I'm reliant on the documents. Your response was provided by email on the 16th of November 2007. Could we have that on screen, please? It's POL 0004916. And it's page two of that document, please. We see the email from you to Juliet McFarlane, copied to Graham Brander, the 16th of November 2007. And you say this, Juliet, thank you for your memo. I am never confident with false accounting charges in relation to recovery under POCA 2002, and the theft charge makes life so much easier. The defendant has general criminal conduct under the proposed charges, and this would be so with just the false accounting. However, we have been challenged once before when proceeding to POCA, where only false accounting was charged, and I would probably be more inclined to accept, 
particular criminal conduct when dealing with confiscation in that scenario. I fully understand the balance of cost in court time against recovery, and if the charge of theft was dropped for a guilty plea, then I would still believe it appropriate to follow to confiscation and ask for a benefit figure of £40,201.58, brackets increase in the value of money. Then you deal with the apparent assets in the case, and at the bottom you summarise your opinion. And your opinion is, one, charge her with theft and go to confiscation, or two, accept a plea of false accounting and go to confiscation. Three, if she pays us before, we can always draw back out of the case, but we need minimum £40,201.58. What stage did you understand the proceedings to have reached when you were providing your opinion? I know it's difficult casting your mind back now. I, 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 I can't recall exactly. I would imagine it, we, we, uh, we were looking at sentencing, right? Uh, sorry, no, uh, that, that's not right. Uh, looking at going to court. court. But I, I'm really not sure what, what position we were at there. But you well, I, I, think, I think we must be in a position where criminal proceedings had started. Yes. Therefore, a charge had been laid because counsel is talking about getting it listed for mention a couple of days later, isn't need to sort it out. So, so there clearly are charges by this stage. So you were not being asked to advise in relation to what charges should be brought in the first place here, were you? No. But asked to advise in the context of whether the theft charge should be dropped? No. I think I was being asked my opinion on how it might affect confis confiscation. Indeed. Do you recall ever being asked to advise on the confiscation implications of potential charges at the time that a reviewing lawyer was making the initial decision whether to charge a suspect, and if so, with what? No. Going, please, to page one of this document... Towards the bottom of the page, there's an email from Juliet McFarlane to Graham Brander, dated the 16th of November 2007, and it is copied to you. And the material parts of it read as follows. Graham, I have forwarded Jed's memo to counsel Richard Jewelry I have informed him that whilst there is no outright objection to proceeding with false accounting, there is a concern as to recovery of money. We have, have to date been able to recover where false accounting only is charged, though on one or two cases the defence will argue against. Whilst a plea to theft would be preferable, in the event of non-payment, the intent would be to proceed to confiscation. And then at the top of the page... Uh, the first page, please. We have an email from Graham Brander to Juliet McFarlane, dated the 19th of November. And it reads, Juliet, Ref Hamilton Mention Hearing, 19th of November 2007, Winchester Crown Court. Richard Jewelry advised me earlier today that he hadn't received this email. Any chance you could forward it to him again? Hamilton pleaded guilty to the 14 FA false accounting charges, agreement by both councils that provided full amount. I advised Richard of increase in value of money, is repaid by sentencing date, 25th of January 2008, then the single theft charge would be dropped. Richard stipulated that if the full amount wasn't repaid by that time, we would go to trial in respect of the theft charge unless it could be shown that payment would soon be forthcoming, in which case sentencing would be adjourned. 
had you ever intended that your view would form the basis of a stipulation that all sums should be repaid in order to avoid a theft trial? No. Are you aware now that the way this was dealt with, that making repayment a condition of dropping the theft charge was criticised by the Court of Appeal when it overturned Mrs Hamilton's conviction? No. There is a memo from Juliet McFarlane, also dated the 19th of November 2007, <coughs> which you were copied into. Can we have that on screen, please? The reference is POL 0004388. We see that this memo goes to the investigation team copied specifically to Graham Brander, you and David Pardo. And it reads as follows. This again relates to the Josephine Hamilton case. The defendant appeared before the court today. The prosecution was represented by Mr. Richard Jury of 9 to 12 Bell Yard. And the defendant was represented by Anita Saran. The defendant pleaded guilty to the false accounting counts two to 15 on the indictment. The case has been adjourned to the 25th of January 2008 for pre-sentence reports. The defendant has been informed that full payment must be made prior to that date. The theft count has remained on file on the understanding that it should be proceeded with if the money is not repaid. It is believed that the defendant has monies which will be available at the end of the year. If the defendant does not repay, then consideration will need to be given to the practicalities of proceeding with the charge of theft or whether confiscation proceedings should pursue. I note that the compensation outstanding is £36,644.89. I note that the figure canvassed of 40201 is a sum which includes interest. The greatest sum will no doubt be pursued should confiscation proceedings be brought. And then this... It has been made clear to the defence that there must be some recognition that the defendant has had the money short of theft and that a plea on the basis that the loss was due to the computer not working properly will not be accepted. As stated above, the next hearing is on the 25th of January 2008. Do you now recall... Mrs. Hamilton raising allegations that the Horizon system was not working properly? Uh, no, I, I, I don't remember that, that memo. You were being told, among others, in this memo that a plea on the basis that the loss was due to the computer not working properly would not be accepted... Can you recall whether you formed any view at the time on the appropriateness of that? No. What is your view on the appropriateness of that as you sit here now? With the knowledge of where we are now, then, then I, it's what probably wasn't, it, well not probably, it wasn't appropriate. Was this a post office line to take? that the computer not working properly was not to be entertained as a defence to a criminal allegation? It's something I'm not aware of, no. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 00119228? This is a memo dated the 16th of September 2009 and scrolling down, actually we can see there, from Paul Southern to the Ford team and it's copied to you. Scrolling back up, please. It reports on the outcome of a case 
and the first paragraph reads as follows. Following successful negotiations between the FIU, the investigator, and the solicitor representing the defendant, the full amount of the loss, £27,407.33, was repaid via a BAX payment into a bank account of Post Office Limited. Was it common for the financial investigation unit to be involved in negotiations in the context of criminal investigations? No. Can you help with why the FIU was being referred to there as being involved in negotiations? No, I, I don't know whether Paul Southin is referring to himself or as the team, but I don't remember that. Where a confiscation order was pursued, did your role involve anything over and above the steps you've already discussed in relation to com uh, confiscation proceedings? No. You have been provided with a number of memos along among the documents which have been provided to you quite recently by the inquiry, which suggests that you were notified following an audit where shortfalls were identified on some occasions. In what circumstances would the Financial Investigation Unit be notified following an audit? You mean by the auditors to, to us, or just following an audit? Well, either by the auditors um, or by someone else following an audit. But at that stage of proceedings where a shortfall had been identified on an audit? I think normally we'd be informed once there was an investigation into, into a a loss over a certain amount, but normally it came came later than that. But we, we were, no, we normally we formed once there was an investigation into a loss. Also among the documents more recently provided to you by the inquiry are a number of memos which suggest that because a case was not being criminally investigated or prosecuted, the late account team should pursue any outstanding losses. <coughs> Does that represent a default position on the part of the post <coughs> to pursue a suspect via a criminal investigation or prosecution, and if that failed to refer to the suspect's, the suspect's case to the late accounts or debt recovery team? I'm sorry, I don't understand. The, are, are you aware of the memos I'm referring to where there is a, a one-liner essentially saying no further action is going to be taken the matter should be referred to the late, the late accounts account. team, yes. so the debt recovery team on the civil side. Yes, I saw that document. Yeah. My question is whether that reflects a default position of the post office, initially to pursue a suspect via a criminal investigation or prosecution, and if that failed, to refer their case to the late accounts debt recovery team. Not that I'm aware of, no. Sir, those are all the questions that I have for Mr. Harbinson. Um, I'm turning to see whether CPs yeah. have any questions. Mr. Jacobs? I do have a question, yes, thank you. Um, we rep I um, act for 156 sub postmasters. Um, one of whom is the widow of Peter Holmes. And you um, deal with his case in your statement 
um, at um, paragraph 159. Do you recall? No, uh, no, I don't recall. Prosecution of Peter Holmes. Maybe um, we could turn then yeah. um, to your statement at page 159. That's uh, 63 of 78. Have that on the screen, please. see that prosecution of Mr. Yes. Um, Peter Holmes. And um, you are um, taken to a, at paragraph 162, you say that you've reviewed emails dated the 30th of January 2009. If we could go to paragraph 162, please. And um, maybe if we could just um, uh, pull up um, POL 00050817 so we know what you're referring to there. And this is um, an email dated the 30th of January um, from you. Um, to what appears to be the criminal intelligence team within Post Office Limited, is that right? Yes. And you're authorising checks in relation to Marion Holmes, um, and we understand that was in relation to her financial matters. Um, what was the criminal intelligence team? Who were they? They, they were an internal team that sat at, in... in um, Croydon, who would obtain um, documents they had connect things like um, um, for um, vehicle checks, uh, that type of thing, they go to DVLC and those types of documents. Now, I know you've said at paragraph three of your statement that you don't remember much about the documents that you've been shown by the yep. inquiry. Um, what was your involvement with the criminal intelligence team? What sort of cases did you refer to them and why would you contact them? I didn't refer cases to them. They, they part of your, um, as, as a financial investigator, as part of your, the, the um, gathering of um, information about assets that might be used in a confiscation order, you, you go to them to get DVLA records about a vehicle to know whether or not it was financed um, or whether or, or um, you know, the make models, that, those type of things um, would come from DVLA. Um, a person's, I can't remember the document, but um, um, when you apply for um, the financial data about something, you know, um, I'm sorry, but I can't remember the, the, actual, uh, the actual document, but um, it would have your history of your payments and things like that. Um, they, they would be the type of documents that they would be able to receive, uh, but they would need to, you'd need to apply to get those. Right. But, and, and there were, there were, there were the, the, the connections within that team that were established with the police and the DVLA and different, different departments that obtained those documents. If we could go to paragraph 163 of your statement, please. Um, sorry to jump around. Um, sorry. Um, that's WITN 08150100. Paragraph 163, please. Which is on page 65 of 78. And in this part of your statement, um, you refer to a memo um, 
and that is um, a memo from Miss McFarlane um, referring you to an accountant's report. Yes. Um, now, Miss, Mrs. Holmes has given evidence to the effect that the post office thought that some money that was in her joint account um, had been taken by her husband and put into that account, and they engaged a forensic accountant, um, and he prepared a report, and as a result of that report, um, Mr. and Mrs. Holmes were completely vindicated, and the post office didn't pursue that further. But the question that I want to ask you is, um, why was it that you were looking at accountants' reports? Did you have any experience in accountancy or any particular knowledge of that field? I did not, no. No. And do you recall looking at or analysing uh, an accountant's report in relation to this case or in, uh, or in other cases? I, I don't recall that, no. And this may be a difficult question for no. you to answer, but are you able to say why it is then that you were given a forensic accountant's report to look at? I could only speculate if you want me to do that. Well, yeah. the, the, because we had the title Financial Investigations, a lot, people thought we had greater um, uh, understanding probably than, than we did have in, in some cases. And I think Juliet may well have been saying, look at this, what, what's your opinion, rather than um, a, a, me having a great understanding of what it what it what it was, and I think I think I know we can't ask Juliet, but but uh, I'm, I I really don't I really don't know why she sent it to me. I can't remember that. Now the Court of Appeal found that Mr. Holmes' prosecution had been an abusive process. They found that ARQ data had been obtained, but it wasn't clear whether it was disclosed, and they found there was no evidence to corroborate horizon evidence, no investigation into the integrity of horizon figures, and there was no proof of any actual loss to the post office. Was this something, was this information that you would have been a party to or aware of at the time when no, you were involved? Sir. No. No, sir. Um, and finally, at the end of your statement, um, paragraphs 166 and 167, we don't need to turn these up. You say, I wasn't aware of any concerns regarding the, the robustness of the Horizon IT system during my entire career with the post office. As far as I was aware, the, the system operated as was expected. And then you go on to say, if I'd ever been aware that there was a potential problem with the robustness of the system, I would have raised this with senior colleagues and flagged to them that, in my opinion, any criminal investigation would need to cease. Now, the sub-postmasters and mistresses that, that we represent are very keen to know the names of the individuals who were the decision makers, who would have been able to put a, a stop to prosecutions once it became clear, or once it should have reasonably become clear, that there were problems with the system because of what sub-postmasters were saying. So my question for you is, can you name the senior colleague or colleagues to whom you've referred who you would have discussed any potential problems with the Horizon system with, with a view to stopping prosecutions if you come to know about these problems with Horizon? Well, I, thank you. Um, I think uh, that um, if, as an investigator, I'd become aware of something like that, I would have spoken to my team leader straight away. If, as a financial investigator, I was aware of that, I would have spoken to Mr Pardo. Um, but, but, you know, it's... You'd, you'd, that information would have to go up, wouldn't it? You'd feed up. So would Mr Pardo, for example, have had the authority to investigate and put a stop to prosecutions on the basis of what he was being told from people like you in your position? Or would that have had to have gone up? I think... I think I'd, I'd, Mr Pardo... Uh, a question for Mr Pardo, but I don't... I think it would need to go up further, yeah. And what about Mr. Utting and Mr. Scott? Are they people that you might have spoken to? I'm, it's unfair of me, I think, to, to speculate on what their, their positions were, sir. The, the question I'm asking is, who would you have gone to, regardless of what they would have done? As an investigator, I'd have gone to my team leader. As a financial investigator, I'd have gone to Mr. Pardo. Okay. Who was your team leader? 
when I was when I was an investigator, it changed a few times. Um, I, it started off as um, uh, Tony Utting. Uh, there was a guy called Paul Dawkins, who was, who was my team leader. There were different people, um, but that's uh, 20 years ago. So I apologise if yeah, that's that's quite right. Thank you. I just need to ask if I have any more questions that I need to ask you. I'm told I don't. Thank you very much. Sorry, sir. Anyone else? Sir, there is a um, there are some questions from Miss Page. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Just very briefly, Mr. Harbinson. I appear for a group of sub-postmasters also, one of whom being Janet Skinner, who sits beside me on my yeah. right. Is that a name that rings any bells for you? From the documentation, yes. You've told us about your opinion that it was more difficult to obtain confiscation in cases where a theft charge had been dropped, leaving only a false accounting charge, <coughs> yes? not dropped, but the difference between a, a theft charge and a false accounting charge, yes. Well, in Miss Skinner's case, that was what happened, and the theft charge was dropped, leaving only a false accounting charge. Even so, there was a uh, confiscation proceedings proceeded, and there was an application from the defence saying that those confiscation proceedings were an abusive process. Does that ring any bells for you? No. I ask because you've told us that there were cases where there were challenges when the only charge left was false accounting. Is this not one of those cases? No. <coughs> no. What were the cases then that you were... I, do, I don't remember the specific case. But they're not, they weren't challenges against confiscation. It's, it's uh, about the amount, what was the value... Of, uh, when it's a false accounting, how did the, uh, what value did they benefit by? And uh, there's different ways you can, you can work out the benefit figure. It's not always totally just the amount that's gone, but you can benefit from um, continuing to receive pay um, having false accounted. Um, so your, the person's payment because, um, so they maintained their job, uh, their money after that period of time could be considered as benefit from criminal conduct. So you, it's, it, I didn't say it's impossible, I said it's more difficult. Well, certainly in Miss Skinner's case and also in Mrs. Adadayo's case and other of our uh, uh, core participants, it was very straightforward. The post office simply proceeded in the same way as it would if it had been a theft charge for the full amount that was the shortfall or that they said was the shortfall. Absolutely, because in fairness, it wasn't for the prosecution to talk down the value of the benefit, but for the defence to 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 um, to say, you know, how do you obtain your, you know, what is your benefit figure? How did you obtain that benefit figure? But you would always go for, for the object of the confiscation within Post Office Limited was to try and recover the loss amount benefit. That, that uh, as the benefit figure. We didn't go beyond that. Um, a lot of uh, um, POCA would allow you, in some respects, to, to accumulate massive benefit figures. The objective of the confiscation was to recover the loss figure. Can you think of any case where you didn't recover the loss figure, even if it was only a false accounting charge, or the figure that post office claimed was the loss? I can't remember now, no. The advice then that you were giving um, to continue with theft charges on the basis of recovery was then based on no cases as such. I, I never advise, uh, my, my advice wasn't to continue on theft charges. My advice was one is easier than the other. And then I think if you see underneath, I say whichever one you do, whatever you do, this is what we should proceed, you know, we should go for these figures. It was, I was giving my opinion. The, the decision for, for the charging was for the criminal law team. Yes, thank you. Those are my questions. On this issue, 
of um, uh, the comparative difficulties of um, pursuing com uh, confiscation in false accounting cases, does it really come to this that if the charge was theft and there was either a finding of guilt or a plea of guilty, then there was acceptance that the money stolen, say, £20,000, was the benefit figure. Yeah? If the charge was false accounting, there would be a variety of ways in which um, benefit could be looked at. But some of those ways would be that the defence would argue that the benefit figure was nothing like as much as the alleged loss to the post office. Exactly, sir, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and you were anticipating, quite correctly, that in some such cases, the, the, the advocates for the defence would maintain that argument before the court, and the court would accept it. Yes. And so from a purely pragmatic point of view, it was much easier if the charge was theft. That's what it boils down to, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, fine. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harbison. Um, thank you for... Oh, sorry, uh, is there, are there any other uh, questions? No, sir. I think those are all the questions from court participants. Fine. Well, then, thank you, Mr. Harbison, for making your witness statement and for giving evidence this morning. I'm grateful to you. Thanks, sir. And so we adjourn until Friday. Is that right, Miss uh, Price? And we have two witnesses on Friday. We do. We resume at 10 o'clock on Friday to hear from Diane Matthews, followed by Lisa Allen. Thank you very much. Let's see you all then. Thank you, sir.